So our scripture for today contains two tiny little words. They're words that seem pretty insignificant on their own, I think. They are two words, little conjunctions, five letters. None of the letters repeat. If you found the words on your own, on their own, you wouldn't think too much about them, probably. But when you put these two words together, they can really pack a bit of punch when you're telling a story. Before I tell you the two words, I'd like to show you how they play out in our storytelling. Now, I've got a picture here for you. Does anybody know who that is doing the little, you know, number at the front? Who's that? George Washington. Yeah, this is George Washington. He's uh, one of the most famous generals in the American Revolution. And this is the moment that he's crossing the Delaware River with some of his troops. My two words are perfectly captured in this moment right here. This story takes place in December of 1776. This is the year that the American colonies had declared their independence from Great Britain and wanted to become a new nation. The people who got behind this movement, the leaders had agreed on this, dec this declaration of really lofty principles. How all people, or at least all men, are, are created equal. They all have these certain rights and that it was the duty of people everywhere to protect those rights. If a government was infringing on those rights, then people had a responsibility to overthrow that government and secure human freedom and flourishing. The people who chose to join this movement in search of independence, they said they were pledging their lives and their fortunes and their honor to the idea. So it's heady stuff, and it's not idle words, because the people who got behind this really were risking everything to try to overthrow a government that they thought was tyrannical. But the year 1776 had not been such a great year for this independence movement. There'd been a lot of fighting in the state of New York in particular, and the Americans had suffered just setback after setback. General, General Washington and his troops had retreated to Pennsylvania, and the state of New York had been lost to the British. And by the time Washington reached December of 1776 in Pennsylvania, fully 90% of the troops who had fought with him in New York were gone. And they were mostly gone because they had deserted. They had quit and gone home because they were convinced that this whole movement was over. There's even a letter from Washington himself that still survives that we have, a letter he had written to his cousin, where Washington himself wrote in December of 1776 and said that Washington himself was pretty sure that the game was up and the whole thing was over and they were about to lose. Then the days leading up to Christmas, Washington thought about his situation. Given how short of men and supplies he was, there seemed to be almost no hope, and yet the ideas of the revolution seemed to be so true. They seemed to be worth fighting for. And so, sitting in his tent on Christmas Eve, Washington came up with this one final plan. And it really would be the final plan. When Washington called his officers together to explain it to them, the code name that they gave the plan was victory or death, which is maybe a touch dramatic, but it really does give you the idea that this was kind of the last gamble. They would try this, and if it didn't work, it was probably the end. What Washington decided to do was to get all his troops in boats on Christmas Day and launch a surprise attack on the enemy forces by crossing this Delaware River. And that's what leads to this moment in the painting. It's Washington and his troops really at the end of their rope, crossing this icy river with almost no hope. But against all odds, the attack succeeded. It was a turning point. The Americans were able to continue the struggle, and of course, eventually, they won the war and created a new country based on these ideas that they were fighting for. Now, that classic story, at least in the way that I've told it, it really turns on two words, and so. Given how short of men and supplies he was, there seemed to be no hope, yet the ideas of the, revolu of the revolution seemed so true, and so, sitting in his tent on Christmas Eve, Washington came up with one final plan. Those two words, and so, means that what follows 
is almost inevitable based on what has come before. The plan that Washington made was crazy. Shouldn't have worked, shouldn't have been attempted. But Washington, if he, if he really believed it all, if he really believed all this stuff about universal rights and the need to protect human freedom, then really, what other choice was there? The situation was awful, but the ideas were true, and so he tried again. Almost inescapable conclusion based on previous events. Our words from 2 Corinthians this morning contain that same and so. We're reading 2 Corinthians 4, verses 13 through 18. You can read along in your Bible or follow on the screen. Be listening for those two words, and so, and what it is that they lead to in our story. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 13 says, Just as we have the same spirit of faith that is in accordance with the Scripture, I believed, and so I spoke. We also believe, and so we speak, because we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and will bring us with you into his presence. Yes, everything is for your sake, so that grace, as it extends to more and more people, may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. So we do not lose heart. Even though our outer nature is wasting away, our inner nature is being renewed day by day. For this slight momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all measure, because we look not at what can be seen, but at what cannot be seen. For what can be seen is temporary, but what cannot be seen is eternal. Now, our and so occurs right off the bat. Verse 13, I believed and so I spoke. That's a quotation from Psalm 116, verse 10. But did you notice what and so does here? In Washington's story, and so leads to this costly, or risky, I guess, military attack. But in the Christian story, and so leads to something different. It leads to hope. Right? We believe, Paul says, and so that leads almost inevitably to speaking. And what we are speaking about is the hope that comes through Jesus. So in this final Sunday of our series about fear and facing our fears, I'd invite you to notice the ground of Paul's hope in verses 14 through 18, what it says about the fears that we each face. The first thing I notice in verse 14 is that we face our fears with the hope of the resurrection. We face our fears with the hope of the resurrection. Verse 14 says, we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and he will bring us with you into his presence. Verse 14 is really almost a perfect picture of Paul's view of the world. If you read Paul's letters, read across the New Testament, it's obvious that Paul believed that he lived in this space between resurrections. There had been one resurrection when God raised Jesus, and that resurrection brought about a new age in human history really a new age in the history of the universe. Everything had changed, and a new era had begun. It's like, like God turned the page, started a new chapter, and all of Paul's life was occurring on this new page. But soon, the page was going to flip again. There was going to be another resurrection, when, when Paul and all the believers in Christ would also be raised. All of Paul's life, he believed, was lived between those two resurrections. And that gave Paul a lot of hope because whatever he encountered in the course of his life, he knew that it was coming in that space between the resurrections, that there was something more to come. And that hope is still ours. All sorts of things can happen in a day. You can have a great thing that happens in your week. You can have a, a neutral thing that happens in your week. Or you can have a really terrible thing that happens to you between now and next Sunday. And if this life that we have, if it's all that there is, then it's easy to get caught up and wrapped up in those things. You can let them pull you down sometimes. 
But Paul talks in the, his other letter to the Corinthians, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, he talks about that, how hopeless life would be without a resurrection. He says, why am I putting myself in danger every hour? If it was merely with human hopes that I fought with wild beasts at Ephesus, Paul says, what would I have gained by it? If the dead are not raised, then let us eat and drink, because tomorrow we're going to die. But of course, our, our daily ups and downs, that's not all that there is. It's not all that Paul's life was, and it's not all that our lives are either. Behind everything, there lies that hope that one day we're going to be brought into the presence of God with Christ, and that all of our brothers and sisters will be there too. We face our fears with that hope on our side. The second thing we see is that we face our fears with hope of renewal on our journey. We face our fears with the hope of renewal on our journey. Verse 16 says, We do not lose heart, even though our outer nature is wasting away, our inner nature is being renewed day by day. Now this is kind of an unusual thing for Paul to contrast our outer nature and our inner nature. He doesn't really do that too often. Usually he just talks about us as spiritual beings. So it's interesting that he does it here, and it's not exactly clear why he does, but one effect of doing it is that it lets him contrast what we see on the outside between what's really going on on the inside. Now on the outside, Paul himself may not have been very much to look at. There's later in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul talks about his experiences in life. He talks about what, he gives you a picture maybe of what you would have seen if you met him on the street. Paul says this, he says, five times I have received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I received a stoning. Three times I was shipwrecked. For a night and a day I was adrift at sea. I was on frequent dirt frequent journeys, in danger from rivers, danger from bandits, danger from my own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers and sisters, in toil and hardship, through many a sleepless night, hungry and thirsty, often without food, cold and naked. So I have a feeling that if you just met Paul on the street, looked at him on the outside, he may not have looked like much. Might have been a bit prematurely gray. Might have a few scars. Might be a bit misshapen in places from bones that had broken and not quite set right. So what's visible on the outside might have been scarred and aging and gray. But Paul says that on the inside, fear does not dominate. There's renewal on the inside day by day. And that is such a promise for us as we face our fears. We have hope that our fears are not just going to continue to grow and grow and grow and one day they're going to swallow us up. It's not going to be like that. There's always hope because each day there's the chance to start again by God's grace, with God's favor. Paul wrote about that same topic in Romans 12, another familiar scripture where Paul tells us not to conform to the pattern of this world, but to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. When we think about ourselves in worldly terms, we don't always see that renewal. We see ourselves getting older. I see, myself, I see my back hurting a lot more, for example. It doesn't always seem like renewal. It seems like we're de decaying. But Paul reminds us that what's important is what's on the inside. When we allow ourselves to be renewed on the inside, we have that hope that our fears won't swallow us. When we ground ourselves in the rhythms of a faith community like this one, we can find renewal. When we sit with the stories of the scriptures, when we see how God has changed people like us, we find renewal. When we lift up our hearts in worship to someone who's greater than we are, we find that renewal. The renewal that's promised us gives us hope that our fears will be held in check. The third and final 
truth that we see is that we face our, here, our fears with the hope that greater things are yet to come. Greater things are yet to come. Verses 17 and 18 say, For this slight momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory that is beyond all measure, because we look not at what can be seen, but at what cannot be seen. For what can be seen is temporary, but what cannot be seen is eternal. My translation says that we're receiving glory beyond all measure. And the Greek word that's used there is, the phrase is from hyperbole to hyperbole. Hyperbole is where we get directly our English word hyperbole. We use a hyperbole to mean a statement that's just really exaggerated, over the top, to make a point. In Greek, hyperbole just means excess or something that's excessive. So what Paul is saying is that our experiences, our hardships that we face through Christ, that is giving us a glory that is from excess to excess. Paul is saying just think of as much glory as you can and multiply it. Just blow the top off of it. It's like God is backing up one of those big 18-wheeler trucks to your house and just dumping the glory out the back. And that's how much glory that there is. It's glory that's beyond comparison, beyond imagination. And that hope really puts our fears in perspective. It doesn't eliminate our fears, but it keeps them in check. There's a theologian named Dorothy Soule who talks about how in the past, Christian teachers often told people in really terrible ways to just endure their suffering, just bear your suffering because you're going to inherit some glory at the end of it. For a long time, we told slaves that. For a long time, we told oppressed women that. Just endure your suffering. Just live with your fear because there'll be glory on the other side of it. And that's not right. That is not right. But the point that Dorothy makes is that today, the pendulum has really swung the other way, and we're more likely to be told the opposite, that you as a Christian never need to have any fear. You never need to have any hardship. You never need to have any suffering, because God is holding out to you right now the good life. It's there right now for the taking, because God is only going to give you the best. And that's not true either. We can only believe that that's true if we suppress the fears that we have. Because we all have fears. We all carry fears with us. To be really, really clear here, what Paul is promising us is not this weight of glory apart from fear. What Paul is promising us is a weight of glory through our fears. We're going to live our lives. We're going we're gonna to experience fear. We're going to experience some anxiety. There will be some hardship. But on the other side of it, we find that these fears give way. And what's left is glory that we find in Jesus Christ. In just a moment, we're going to sing a song that's called Overcome. And the chorus says this. It says, We will not be moved when the earth gives way, for the risen one has overcome. And for every fear, there's an empty grave, for the risen one has overcome. Now that's the promise, perfectly captured, that Paul is giving us here in 2 Corinthians. We all live with fear. It's a part of being human. But our fears meet their match in the empty grave of Jesus Christ. And the only thing that we find in that empty grave is hope. So this morning, I would encourage you to ask yourself, how can I ground my life more in that hope? Is there something that I can do this week that reminds me that as I wake up and my feet hit the floor, I don't face it alone. I don't face it with just my fears, but that alongside my fears, there is this hope. Maybe there's a practice that you need to adopt this week. Maybe you want to come back and commit to read this scripture every day this week to remind yourself of the hope that you have. Maybe this morning you just need somebody to just talk to you for a minute and remind you that the hope is there. That helps me sometimes, just to hear someone else say it out loud. It really helps me. If you just need a reminder that that hope is real, I'll be at one of the tables in the back. 
I'd love to pray with you and just remind you that you're not in this alone because Christ's grave is empty and there is hope there for you. If you've never encountered Christ for the first time, maybe you don't have that hope. I'd love to meet you in the back and pray with you about that too. But as we go this morning, it's so, so crucial as we face our fears that we remember that through those fears, there lies hope and glory.